Well, welcome to the second video of Lesson 9 on general practice and ethics and other material related to the legal aspects of being a professional engineer. I suspect you will see several questions on the FE exam of this material. So I'm going to start right off with intellectual property. If you got something out of this lesson that you found useful or helpful in any way, I would like you to consider subscribing to my channel. Now, intellectual property. Not going to get into all the details on this. Do expect that there might be a question on this, though. What is intellectual property overall? And there are terms you need to understand. I'm not going to define them all here because they get quite complicated. But copyright. Copyright's the easiest one to deal with. You can actually copyright something very easily. Most states provide an easy way to do that for no cost. You can copyright any material that you've created. Even YouTube assumes that the first person who puts something up in a video, they automatically have copyright privileges of that. That assumption is made. Now, obviously, that could be argued in court, and then they could find out later that this person actually copyrighted it well before the other person actually produced it. Then they probably would win in court, but the assumption is the first one who shows it has the copyright. And it's something all of, all of us content creators have to be aware of in putting material up onto YouTube. Then there are trademarks. Now, trademarks are a much more involved process. You have to have a lawyer to get that because trademarks can be very subtle in what a trademark is. Just creating a graphical image or a set of letters that you use to represent your company products, you can make trademarks for any or all of that. However, it may be hard to argue that you're the one that should copyright the word intelligent, let's say for whatever you've created. So if you want to create a new camera, right, that has some smarts to it, like the one I'm talking to right now, then you could decide that you want to use the trademark intelligent. I put the little TM next to that, as you've seen. I doubt any trademark judge will give you that trademark because that word is too common. If you create a special symbol, that's a little bit easier, like the symbol that I use to represent my website, PE for Doers. I went around and did a look on that. I didn't go through the expense or the process of trademarking that, so I am somewhat vulnerable that somebody else could use that. But maybe as I grow, I might change my mind on this, and if I find out somebody else is using this, I would change it and make that my trademark, to be totally honest with you. One that's very costly, though, beyond trademarks, it gets into what are called trade secrets, and trade secrets are much more harder to define. You've got to have a lawyer involved with that. And you have to have other agreements to this called non-disclosure agreements with anybody who has access to those trade secrets. So you're talking about many, many different legal documents that are involved in that. It's not just one. And there's no way of actually filing a trade secret. You have to have all the mass of supporting material agreements and everything else to represent the trade secret. And you have to have protections around it. If you make the mistake of putting something up on YouTube, you can't turn around and try to sue somebody that that's a trade secret later on because you went and put it in the public domain. Patents, and there are multiple different types of patents. The two main categories are the utility patent and the design patent. Each one of these are very extensive processes that you have to pay enormous fees and have a lawyer that helps you through this. Sometimes these take years to get. That's why you hear the term patent pending. That means they've started the process to patent something. And that has the force of law. Because if you started a patent on something that somebody else suddenly decides to start a patent on, that's the first phase of them trying to get a patent. It makes sure that there's not an existing patent pending on that. Now, they can patent pend it too, but yours, since it went on first, would be priority. And if you refused the patent for some reason, it's not to say that they will be refused as well. They could get that patent if your application failed. Just as one example, ethical precedence. Now, I put this on here, and you'll see this uh, in a couple of the references that I mentioned earlier. There are ethical guidelines that you need to follow for different, what we call, interested parties. I guess that's the legal term for it. And the interested parties on your ethical behavior as a professional engineer include overall public society and the public as a whole. I mean, the whole idea of having a 
professional engineering license is to protect the public. So that's number one. Then of course you have the laws. They tend to mostly be state enforced, although there's a couple of federal laws that are out there that cross over into this as well. I'm not going to get into the detail of that, but just realize that there are a lot of laws involved with ethical behavior of a professional engineer. Then there's the engineering profession as a whole. So, for example, NCEES and other organizations that expect you to behave in a certain way. But it's, it's not just them. There are other general groups that have set up like IEEE that has an interest that the professional engineers follow ethical behavior. Then next in line will be the client that you're doing work for. You generally are doing professional engineering services as a consulting engagement. Not always generally and they and they would be your client then there's your employer you may work for an actual employer a partnership or an individual company that has a board of directors and a set of owners whatever and then finally it would be the other engineers all engineers are hurt if an engineer does not follow ethical behavior so you have a responsibility to them to to do things in an ethical manner some key points for code of ethics. One is creed. A creed is a statement or oath, a societal type of oath. Now you can also have organizational oaths. For example, in addition to being a professional engineer, I am also a certified information systems security professional. I've been that for just about 20 years now. And they made us do an oath that if I were to violate that oath, I'm expected to turn in all of my certification material, which would be wall certificates, and I get a new one every three years, so it would be the original one plus every one that I have in my possession that I didn't destroy after that. And I also need to turn over my pocket card that they've given me, and I can never use CISSP with my name again, and I could not therefore be considered a certified information security professional. Then there are statutes. Now these are specific laws, usually state laws, or the actually it's the it's the regulations that are produced by your state PE board. And those are enforceable in law. Policies and, and other uh, material that they produce that you must follow, the statutes. Canon. A canon is a body of principles. Now this is usually defined by an industry group. So for example, IEEE, you know, in addition to being an organizational group that's interested in professional engineers, they are also an industry group overall that has an interest. And so they have canons or general guidelines or principles that they've come up with that they expect an engineer to follow. And these will vary by the organization. And then finally, the code. Now the code is not necessarily tied directly to professional engineering profession but it's tied to you doing certain things. For example, you can't just haphazardly build a house. Even if you don't require a professional engineer to help you build that house, depending on your jurisdiction and the, the local laws around building. However, you generally still have codes. You can't just go ahead and do the electric any way you'd like to do. There are specific codes you have to follow by your state and your local jurisdiction that you must follow in terms of how you wire the electrical outlets, for example, how the wiring comes into the building, and many other codes associated with it. It gets quite detailed. But there are other codes, for example, civil engineers obviously have the most codes from what I've seen. So the civil engineers, a lot of their PE exam is code-based. And a lot of their questions on their PE exam are based upon the codes that the civil engineering have to follow. These are all tort enforceable, however. If something is an actual statute, which is further up on the list here, then that's enforceable potentially with criminal charges if you violate them. And then finally, there's modal law. The modal law is what NCES came up with. It's a set of policies and guidelines that most states follow and have included in their state ethical guidelines as well. And they include what you have to do for, for your license obligations to the public, to employers and clients, and to other licensees or other engineers. And then they talk about the general requirements for getting a license. 
and any grounds for disciplinary action. NCEES can actually recommend disciplinary action to your state board. The state boards will listen to them. So if they find out that you've done something unusual by divulging tests to engineers that are trying, or people that are trying to become engineers, chances are you could lose your license from your state board if NCES notifies them of that. And then any exemption clauses that they think should be followed. A lot of the exemption clauses are very specific to specific rules. For example, they are trying their best to get as much reciprocity amongst states as they can right now. So they try to come up with exemptions. For example, if you're a PE in one state for at least 15 years, they recommend to the states, and all states have gone along with that, that the state should issue you a license in their state without any problem, as long as you're in good standing. And they will check with NCES and your state board to verify that before they issue a new license. A lot of people have multi-state licenses, and NCES helps with that process. They have an online tool that uh, they do charge for, but in the first few phases of it, it's free. And I suggest if you live in an area that is the junction of multiple states like I do, the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, tri-state area, then you should be aware that if you want to practice in the neighboring states that you need to get licenses for those other states. And then there's something called a corporate exclusion. This is one of the things that surprised me about professional engineers, to be honest with you. But if you work as a professional engineer for your company and all you're doing is engineering work within your company, for example, you are designing plans for a product that your company sells and you're an employee of that same company, believe it or not, in most cases, there's some exceptions, but in most cases you do not need to be a PE, a professional engineer, to do that. Now, a lot of companies will still want at least their lead professional engineers or their lead engineers to be PEs, but they don't really have to do that. And it's called a corporate exclusion. Licensure considerations. States have similar laws, but they're not exact in terms of the issuing of licenses. Just be aware of that every state has a different set of rules that they follow, and you have to understand what your state rules are. The National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying, or NCEES, they are the folks that create the standardized test for all states and most PE disciplines, as we've mentioned them multiple times already. Now, there is some consideration for reciprocity on certain states, but it's really what I just referred to as the guidelines that come out of NCEES that recommend if you're already a license in one state, that the other state should issue you a license just charging you the fees for the license. They generally, I, it's very rare, I think there's a couple of exceptions, but they generally do not automatically accept the license of another state. It's similar to like notary publics. Uh, I'm also a notary, I've been a notary for probably 28 years now, and it's the same thing. You have to have a license for the state that you're doing the notary work in. I have one for New York. I used to have one for New Jersey when I had an office that I worked at on a regular basis there, but I let that one go once I changed employers. Registration and renewing. I already mentioned continuing education units. That varies by the state. As I said earlier, New York has 36 required every three years. There are fees. No way around that. Every state has fees for this. Sometimes they'll, they'll exempt fees in special cases. The actual state boards have the right to do that, and they have done it for special situations, like somebody having been uh, an engineer but then getting called into active duty and they're in active duty where it actually expires while they're there. I've heard of some states, as soon as they come back, they'll renew them without a renewal fee. But that's a very uh, tough exemption to get. You've got to apply for it through the state board. But there's also this thing called title retention. Believe it or not, most states, again, not 100%. Even if you let your registration go, and there's two separate things. There's your actual, the, f the fact that you've passed a PE exam makes you a professional engineer. But you can't practice as a professional engineer unless you're registered in the state that you want to practice. Usually that's where the fees beyond the test fees are incurred. But let's say you decide to temporarily retire and then you don't want to renew your license fees every three years. Well, you should let them know this so that they can put you on a hold pattern. They have an actual term for it, but 
that's not as important as understanding the concept. You keep the title, however, professional engineer. You can use it on your professional resume. You can use it on your business cards, everything else. It's just that you cannot stamp something. So if you suddenly have a job that you have to stamp, then, for example, in New York, you'll have to go ahead and make sure you get the 36 continuing education credits, which you can do within one week, and then re-register with the state. And you can't stamp the documents until you do that, but you get to keep the title. In the next part, I'm going to be talking about a sample test. I mentioned it earlier in this video to kick things off. And that test will have a number of problems. I haven't decided on the number yet, but whatever number it is, it'll be much more than I've ever presented before. I want to run that video in a way that simulates the real test. So you're going to have to answer all the questions. I'm going to try to make it so that the actual video times you, but obviously you can go around that if you wanted to. I'm going to ask you not to. And then we'll see how you do at the end of that test. It'll probably be a separate video where I go over the actual answers to that one and give you an idea of how well you did and then give you some motivation to go forward when you take the test. So that's the final part coming up. It may be one or two videos and then this program is done and then on to the professional engineering program of a similar nature that I have in my plans. Anyway, thanks for watching and if you've gotten something out of this video I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to my channel. It would really be helpful. I really can't grow unless I get the subscriptions growing at a regular pace, believe me. You're going to see my head pop up here in a moment. Just click on that, follow along, and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Thanks for watching.